unusual background being a pediatrician and a practitioner um, and so coming back to you how did you get interested in entrepreneurship why did you think it could be the best way to have an impact in the world and maybe how did you come to meet your co-founders and get to the decision that you wanted to go to Berlin to actually build this company yeah so I was um, so I trained as a doctor in um, the UK and I was working in hospital medicine for several years. Um, and in many ways that was fantastic and you're helping patients and doing something very interesting. Um, but I always had a little bit um, uh, sort of like itchy feet or something. I was missing out on, on um, something. I was always a little bit envious of friends that were doing other things, all kinds of other things, you know. So I had a lot of other interests. Um, and I'd been very creative at school and loved art and design and that kind of thing. And, and I guess I felt like that side of me wasn't at all fulfilled in clinical medicine. Um, but I'd never really read about, heard about, thought about startups or entrepreneurship at all while I was a practicing doctor. And I had absolutely no um, contact with entrep any entrepreneurs. I didn't know any. Um, but, but actually, in 2009, I started a PhD in Cambridge in the UK. Um, very deep science, neuroscience, I was looking down microscopes all day, this kind of thing. Um, but one of the really fantastic things about being sort of outside of the hospital for a period of time and um, back at university and surrounded by people from so many disciplines was all the different things you can get involved in. And in particular, I started going to the business school and their startup events and um, uh, workshops. They had, a, um, they had a, a talk every week called Enterprise Tuesday, which was a, a sort of successful Cambridge entrepreneur talking about how they did it. And, and this was a new world for me, but it was really exciting. Um, and I started imagining the kind of things I could potentially work on in healthcare that could have a huge impact. Um, this was 10 years ago now, um, and it was really the very beginning of people getting excited about digital health, really the very beginning. Um, and I was the only doctor at these events, so engineers would often come up to me and sort of say, oh, I'm working, you know, we're working on something, could you introduce us to some doctors, we need some NHS contacts, could you advise us, etc. So I, I did a little bit of um, just very unofficially advising uh, quite a lot of startup teams. Um, and I, I went to a startup weekend myself in Cambridge um, and, and met, it was all really all tech people apart from me actually pretty much, almost entirely. I was the only, certainly the only doctor, but there were about nine teams who were working on health tech ideas. Um, and so after that, I started working with a couple of the engineers I met there on some ideas. Um, and I was building a case sharing platform and it was a really early prototype. And I, I started, at this point in time, I realized how hard it was gonna be for, the, for me and this engineer, neither of us had started a company before, to do this alone. But we were persisting. And I also started Doctorpreneurs, as you mentioned. Um, and uh, I was invited to talk in Berlin. Um, this was seven years ago now. And um, at the end of my talk, uh, somebody came over to me and said, I want to introduce you to someone, uh, the founder of a company called Medex, it wasn't called Ada at the time, Medex. Um, and it was, a, it, it was sort of the first few months um, of Daniel and Martin, my two co-founders, working together, a couple of engineers and so forth, um, trying to sort of prototype a decision support tool for doctors. Um, and they didn't have a doctor on the team. And I was working on something kind of similar um, and long story short, we ended up deciding that we would have, you know, more chance of making this a success together than separately and with a doctor on their team. Um, and uh, both Martin and Daniel have um, started and exited companies before, smaller companies than Ada, but they had that experience and I came with the medical experience, so we felt that this combination was a good one. That's cool. 
most people I see have their opposite problem. They live a normal start of IVs and then they go to the hospital and they enjoy it because they feel that every day you spend there you see another problem, which could be another company, um, and you uh, experience it the other way around. Um, so the, the vision you have for ADA is somehow something we heard for a long time. Um, maybe IVM was what Sun pioneered a long time ago. Uh, and then you decided, together with your two co-founders, to bring it to life. Uh, how did you know that the timing was right to go and sell this vision of an AI that would kind of replace slash support your GP? Um, how did you know it was about the right time? Um, if you ever knew. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know if you ever really know it's the right time. Sometimes startups are too early or, or too late, but for sure we, were, we, we believed there was a need, you know, a huge user need. Um, and yeah, so technology was now at a point where um, uh, you could potentially fix this problem, solve this problem in a way that hadn't been done before. Um, actually, I remember having conversations in my college in Cambridge with um, some sort of senior academics who knew the people who had worked on early probabilistic medical decision support tools, sort of in the 70s or something, 60s, 70s. And, um, and so they said to me, oh, this has been tried before and it didn't work, so you know, why would it work for you? But of course, that, that was a time when even if the um, accuracy was quite good for a very few, you know, few diseases, a very limited number. Um, it was so clunky and difficult to use, um, and and slow, uh, and very difficult to build it out to cover thousands of conditions the way we do. So you know, the technology clearly wasn't sort of ready then. It wasn't possible to build something that um, was was actually you know ready for the for the for the user. Um, and clearly things have moved on since then, and, and the need still persisted, you know. Um, so, uh, uh, for sure though, you don't know it all. When you, st when you start at the beginning, you, know, you have a, something of a vision and an idea of what you're gonna do, and then it's a, a winding road, you know. It's not a straight line, you know. We've, we've changed tack a little bit over the years, we've learned things, we've, you know, we've, we've um, uh, we've, we've constantly iterated and, and made changes along the way as we've learned. Hey, the, the story kind of intrigues me uh, somehow because I think it's, it's an idea that like a lot of people would have to replace or help the GPs uh, and that most people would never be able to get out of the ground. Um, there are like so many different chicken and eggs problems that you need to solve. You need to get data before being able to actually diagnose people. You need to create trust out of thin air for, for patients to actually trust you. And you need to create some kind of brand and distribution. Uh, how did you actually get started? And how did you convince the first people around you to uh, follow you? So I should start by saying we're not trying to replace G GPs. Um, uh, because... Uh, that would be very controversial. <laughs> um, so we got started by focusing um, narrowly at first. So we started with doctors. So now um, we do have doctor-facing tools and we have a platform that can connect patient and doctor. Um, but, uh, but our scale has largely been come through the cons consumer route in the last two years. Um, but we started off seven years ago focused on doctors and initially on specialists in one particular area, which was vertigo. Um, and so we were very focused on that one area, that one problem. It's an area of medicine where um, there's a lot of um, overlap in how the different, con the, the different vertigo conditions, sort of um, conditions that cause vertigo present. They're very often confused with each other. There's a lot of misdiagnosis, not only by GPs, but neurologists. Um, and so we worked with the specialist center to build sort of an MVP, something that worked in that setting and that the junior doctors could use to sort of work at, um, uh, at a level of maybe somebody who'd, who'd trained, who'd been there for a couple of years, you know, from the very beginning. So it, it was saving them time and improving their clinical practice. Um, and then we expanded from there. So we went, we moved across to um, related specialties like neurology, where there's quite a lot of overlap with, with symptoms and presentations. 
um, uh, as there is uh, as, as, as in the um, so vertigo and neurology. Um, and then we decided, you know, now it's time to expand to all of general medicine, which was a, a huge undertaking, a huge undertaking, but we felt our learnings in that time had been that the majority of delays in diagnosis um, and, and therefore the opportunity for the greatest impact was closer to the patient. So it's with the generalists, the GPs, and in fact, potentially even you know, going direct to the patient. And to do that, we had to cover everything because you don't know what you know you don't know what specialty it is before you put your symptom in you know so uh, and, and uh, if you only cover a very narrow branch of uh, medicine Ada's is always going to think you know it must be one of these few things that i know and and, and very often get it wrong so you can't it, it can't work like that so we went broad um and uh at the same time, we started thinking about how can we how can we build tools for the patient to actually you know use this same knowledge and uh, this powerful technology that we built themselves. So this was the sort of journey. On the on the consumer side, it often looks like it's magic on the back end. Uh, you ask a couple of questions and you get answers. I guess you I guess you built an internal process and I would like to map an entire vertical. It kind of starts as rule based and then you move into uh, something that's more AI based and if you call it AI, I'm interested in knowing how you actually get the feedback loop to train the model from time to the patient that it might be this to actually knowing it was this. Uh, so how, do you, how can you build the models? Yeah. Um, so it's actually not a rule-based system, so there are no rules, it's completely probabilistic. Um, so uh, traditionally, symptom checkers have been like a decision tree, you know, so you get asked a question, yes, no, um, or one of, one of um, two or three options, whatever, and then you, you go down the branch, you know, and then you get the next question, and you go down the next branch, and so forth. Um, and that method's very limited. Um, uh, it's difficult to build something with sort of infinite branches, um, and as soon as you go down a branch, then if you happen to have you know gone down the wrong branch, you can't really get back again. So they're very limited systems. So we wanted to build a probabilistic system from the very beginning that works much more like the human medical brain works, how doctors thinks a little bit like how doctors think, um, but maybe with better memory and, and not making <laughs> some of the same mistakes. Um, so what we've built is a, a, a big knowledge base, a huge knowledge base, thousands of conditions, symptoms, findings, risk factors, you know, how those conditions present, how common they are in different parts of the world, in different types of people, what risk factors um, affect your chance of having that condition, etc. Um, and in fact, the knowledge base goes beyond what you see in the consumer app because we have professional facing tools to inve examination, investigation and so forth. So we've built all this knowledge um, and then Ada asks a series of questions to try and narrow down you know, what might be going on here and with each piece of information the patient replies, or the, the, the person responds. Um, Ada's re-evaluating the whole time and then asking, and then asking the next question. Um, so this is, uh, you know, form, a form of AI. Um, we haven't sort of taught it what it must, uh, told it what the, the system what questions need to be asked. It's constantly reevaluating and deciding what question is useful next. Um, and then we continually improve this system through a range of different, uh, sort of a lot of different approaches. So we have a kind of suite of tools that. Um, that flags up for our in-house experts. We have a team of doctors who work in-house curating this knowledge base. Um, and I guess you'd call it a little bit of a man-machine collaboration going on between this suite of tools and these doctors with the tools flagging up uh, areas in our knowledge base where there are gaps or potential discrepancies. Um, and based on feedback that's coming back from patients or from doctors using the platform, you know, where there might be uh, certain inaccuracies or weaknesses. Um, we can see things like how often certain questions are responded to with, um, I don't know, or I don't understand. So, you know, we can see if certain questions maybe aren't so clear and so forth. So there's lots of things that are being flagged up. 
Um, so it's kind of a semi-automated improvement, but then we have doctors in the loop. So the last thing you want to do with a medical system is train it on bad data. You know, if you, if you, if patients are telling you they had X, but actually they didn't, and you're training on that data, then you you actually um, risk um, you know bringing inaccuracies into this sort of um, high quality knowledge base that's been built. So it's a, it's a careful process. Yeah, it's indeed like a, an area where research still doesn't know how to eliminate bias from an initial data set uh, an AI trains on, which is a big problem in uh, low, for example, because if uh, uh, certain racial be race, race has been a factor in decision making, it will continue to be uh, a bias in the future if the AI is trained on the wrong data, and it's the same with uh, else issues. Um, you do name ADA, as a person, uh, we've seen Amazon name Alexa as a person, and a lot of them. Do you think it's part of building trust? It's part of building the brand, or it's part of just building pr uh, intimacy between the patient and your service? Yeah. So when we um, when we were building out the consumer side, uh, we we realized that Medex, which is probably quite a good name for a doctor-facing tool, wasn't going to be the best name for building sort of familiarity and trust with the consumers. Um, and, and so we started thinking about what can we call this. Um, we wanted something that sounded approachable and friendly. Ada, um, there's a few reasons for choosing Ada. Um, we wanted a, a um, I guess, we, want, we wanted something that sounded um, kind of soft, we were looking for something with vowels either side, you know, so we're looking at lots of names like this, maybe this was something that went into the Alexa thought, I, you know, I, I don't really know. By the way, just as a complete aside, one of our investors and advisors um, founded Evie, another female name with vowels either side, um, uh, that got bought by Amazon and became Alexa, so he's one of our advisors, but the name had nothing to do with that. Um, so we, we wanted a, a a friendly sounding name. Uh, Ada Lovelace uh, was the first um, computer programmer, supposedly. So we thought that was also a nice kind of reference. Um, and uh, the other thing is that we were on Adel Adelbertstrasse. And so, um, you know, I, I don't really think it was the reason for choosing it, but the people in the team, re you know, the team really, really loved the idea that we were naming. Uh, we were naming ourselves after our uh, address, Ada. <laughs> it's kind of nice. And did it, did it, was it a, a man or a woman? Was it a, like a discussion? And like, was there a bias you would have? Um, I mean, Ada or Ada, I guess, but Ada is a female name. Um, uh, and uh, I feel very comfortable with it being female so um, uh, but we uh, I, I don't really refer to Ada as she I refer to it as it but yeah it's a female name it is okay um, so today you reached uh, quite a massive scale there's like millions of users tens of millions of questions asked uh, and the data set that becomes I hope better and better um, how did you reach that scale, and how do you plan to make uh, the entire ecosystem benefit from all this data? Because I think I read somewhere that you guys plan to uh, become a platform and like partner with other people that can deliver value on top of the data set you guys built. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the scale really started to happen when we launched the consumer app, you know, so it's completely free. Um, and, and so it took off um, all around the world, first of all in English speaking markets, um, and then we've added a number of languages, so we're now also available in German, Spanish, Portuguese, French, um, we'll, uh, we're translating into a number of other languages, so we'll be launching more languages, Swahili, um, Hindi, Mandarin, a number of other languages over the coming months, and obviously this just means we can reach um, more and more people. Um, you know, searching for symptoms, health searches, and especially searching for symptoms is one of the most common reasons people use Google. Um, so everyone's sort of, 
when you've got something wrong and you don't know what it is, you want to try and find out. And, um, and, and so I think it's a common, it's a universal need all around the world. Um, and, uh, and more and more people now have, have, have smartphones, of course. You know. so, um, so I think we, uh, we're doing something, well, it's a little bit this timing thing you asked about earlier. You know, it happens to be the right timing in terms of there's a need. It's, it's a u universal need and it's, it's a need that's always been there. Um, but it's just the right timing in terms of, you know, people now have the technology to do this in a way that's much more personalised, much more in-depth and sophisticated than a Google search. And so, um, you know, if you're good, then people hear about it. Yeah, yeah. Regarding timing, I believe that a um, couple of years ago was exactly the right time to have mass adoption on computer, um, mobile products. And uh, that's when you got the Uber and uh, Instagram started to have massive growth and I guess you can free ride that, uh, that market did that happen to work really well. Um, on the opening as a platform, uh, you mentioned two things. You mentioned you're opening in new languages. I think I read also that you partnered with, partnered with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, which mission is, one of their mission is to like improve people's health all around the globe. Uh, how, what was their process in approaching you, maybe you approach them, and how do they work and how do you select the geographies you're going to work together with them? Yeah, so, um, I mean, it was a number of discussions, um, and uh, I, get, I think the key thing for them is impact at scale. And um, a tool like Ada has, you know, real potential for very significant impact at scale um, and uh, reaching populations that it's, it may be very hard to meet, reach through other means. Um, you know, so uh, if, they can, if they have access to a smartphone and smartphones are getting you know, cheaper, you can get a, a hold of an Android phone very, very affordably um, these days, then, then you can start to be able to reach people who don't, you know, in parts of Africa, for example, who don't have any access to a doctor. Um, if they want, if they needed to get to a hospital, it could be days travelling, um, but they do have access to a smartphone, whether it's theirs or a family member or uh, someone at their school, you know. So, so they see they see that opportunity, um, and uh, we started off in East Africa, so sort of Tanzania in particular, and translating into Swahili there, and focusing on. Um, localization, making sure that we cover all the relevant diseases, we have the right um, uh, sort of data in the app with regards to how common those diseases are in that part of the world. So obviously malaria is a very different prevalence in, 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 in that part of the world to, uh, to Germany, for example, um, and we need to take account of that um, for users who are there. So we're working with them to, um, oh sorry, this is actually, this is not Annabelle and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, partnership, this is a Botner Foundation partnership, but they're both in Africa, these partnerships. So, um, so we're focusing a lot on that. With Bill and Melinda Gates, we've been focusing on um, uh, helping, uh, looking, looking at how we can guide people to appropriate next steps and tests and so forth. So, uh, if it's likely you've got malaria, how can we do point of care testing? Um, so, so you know, guide people towards the right next steps and know what's going to be um, an appropriate um, and useful test to have next. So we're working with them on that. That's also something you're working on in Germany. Like uh, having an uh, end to end uh, medical um, parcours <laughs> in French. No, we're going to end of end journey. Uh, like you start on Ada, and at the end, it tells you to go see a specialist, to go to a pharmacy, to work with uh, insurers. So you start to go into an end to end uh, experience. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, so we're doing that in a few markets, and we have partnerships um, with uh, health plans and health systems, um, where we're helping to guide users towards um, providers and services within those within those systems or within those plans. So, um, the right kind of service for you that's uh, near to you and that's available to you, potentially covered by your health plan. Um, 
And, and so we're, we're, we're doing that in Germany, we're doing that in the UK, in the US, um, and we're also looking at that in um, low middle income countries, um, uh, various places, apart, parts of Africa, for example, through these um, global health partnerships that we have. So you, you, may, you managed to convince these Bill and Melita Gates foundations and many other people to support you, but you also managed to uh, secure serious funding over the years. Uh, how do you convince investors to back uh, a seemingly impossible to realize uh, project? Uh, there's no clear monetization path in the short term. Uh, how did you guys go about that? Yeah, so we started with angel investors um, here in Germany, actually. Um, and that was through personal networks. So that was uh, people who had um, uh, prior knowledge of um, uh, the founding team and worked with, the, with Daniel or Martin before on things and so forth. So um, that was how we were funded in the early days. Um, and then, you know, we focused entirely on the product and building a high quality product. Um, and it's a stepwise thing, but you show some, uh, you show progress. And, our, and then if your investors believe in that progress and they really think there's an opportunity there, then, um, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll invest more money and that's what happened. And then uh, over the years, um, as we continue to improve the product and pilot it, doctors and build out, um, you know, test business models and so forth, those investors put more money in um, so that we could continue to grow the team. Um, they brought on other investors, so, you know, they were, they recommended us to people they knew who, um, who then also wanted to um, get in on the opportunity. Um, and, and at some point, you know, we did have, um, you know, much clearer path to sort of uh, how we were going to build a sustainable business and make money through this, um, could show revenues and so forth, and then and then you uh, then you're at a point where it's easier to bring in institutional um, money. Great. Congrats on the millions and millions of the team you guys have built. Um, a lot of the companies advise uh, somehow they don't like competition, uh, but. Inside them, it's basically one of the fires that burns and that helps them like do more every day. Uh, in your case, when the goal is to bring like a GP in the end of everyone all around the world, do you crave for them to die, or do you want your competitors to like thrive? Like, how do you end up competition? Um, and here we're we're talking about GPs as the competition. No, 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 uh, like the Babylon else of the world. Um. And I think if you're, if you're working on an important problem, um, then uh, you're, you're going to have competition, for sure. You know, I mean, if, if, if you have no competition, then maybe you're not working on something important. Um, uh, and actually, if you think you've got no competition and you look hard enough, you'll probably find you do have, you do have a lot of competition. And sometimes it's not direct, it might be more indirect, you know, sort of substitutes rather than, um, abs you know, sort of, uh, clear, clear competitors, but for sure, if you're doing something important, they'll be there, um, and that's a good thing. Um, and yeah, I think it's you know it's a, it's an, there's a huge need. It's an important problem, um, and that there's space for many people to be successful. Actually, I think in this um, in this field, but of course, of course, everyone on our team wants to be the best. Yeah, I mean, why would you want to be building the second best product in the space? So. I, I think we're, we're really proud of the product we've built. Um, we celebrate a lot when we, um, you know, we get, we get amazing feedback all, all, every day actually on the uh, app reviews and so forth. So it's difficult to keep, keep track of it. Um, now we have so many users, but I have to say that there's lots of celebrating when there's, um, you know, good news, when we know we've really impacted a patient, when someone writes to us and, and tells us that this kind of thing. Um, and for sure, we're spurred on by wanting to build the very best product in this space. Yeah, I did see that 150,000 reviews, maybe five, so congrats yeah. also. Uh, do you have like a couple like examples that you always communicate on internally that are probably all going to make us cry? So, uh, we, I mean, we have examples, um, so, so it's kind of a range, you know, people tell us that they've had 
um, uh, a rare disease that took many, many years to be diagnosed um, and that a two-minute assessment on ADA brought up, you know, maybe they've already had the diagnosis and then they test ADA and then they, 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 um, they tell us, you know, it took two minutes. Imagine if I'd had this app, you know, ten years ago. Um, uh, all those years of going around different doctors and suffering. So, you know, no doctor can have all that information and all those conditions in their head. Um, and that's a very typical path with rare diseases, that the average is five to seven years to diagnosis and eight, eight doctors seen. So we, we get a lot of feedback um, um, from people uh, telling us stories like that. Um, we often get feedback from people who said they weren't, who told us they weren't sure if, um, if they should s sort of go to see a doctor urgently or any. Um, and an ADA assessment told them it was something urgent, appendicitis, um, pancreatitis, actually, uh, one patient wrote um, for his uh, family member. Um, and then they therefore, as a result, rushed to hospital and then that exact diagnosis was confirmed and they were, and they were getting treatment and very grateful for that. Um, we have feedback, so we had feedback um, once a review from a pharmacist in rural Africa who told us that his life had been changed because uh, there's no doctor in the village and um, uh, everyone comes to him for medicines and he doesn't know what to advise but now he has Ada and he uses it, you know, and he's kind of become the village doctor and he's using Ada to help him um, decide what medicines to give people and, 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 and that's great for him, so. <laughs> he didn't write that he started a cult after that. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a wide range. And uh, more down to Earth's question, when you have so many different types of people that use your product, uh, either because they want a faster access to a GP or a first diagnosis, or because no one really knows what happens to them, how do you actually focus on your message and your marketing uh, on the day-to-day? -day? Because you started with tens of 10,000 users, uh, it's hard to just be like the GP in your hands or something like this uh, at the very beginning. Yeah, well, I think, um, yes, so we are an app that uh, is relevant for people of any age and with any illness, you know, because if you have a symptom, then hopefully Ada knows that symptom and then you can do an assessment. Um, on the other hand, um, it's a very specific need and use case, you know, so you, you have a symptom, you don't know what it is, uh, you're looking for information, reassurance, guidance, you want to understand what should I do next, so, um, so I think you can focus in on the need and the problem rather than a type of person um, and, and then message around that and how, we, how Ada helps people to solve that need. Um, I'm going to turn to questions from the room uh, and just before that mention that I think ADA is hiring 130 people in the next couple of months so I'll go on their page to help make the world a better place. Yeah, it's true. I didn't ask you to say that actually yeah, but uh, somebody <laughs> must have done. <laughs> um, yeah, we've just got a, a, a second office in Mitter as well, um, as well as offices in London. Uh, New York, Munich, um, so uh, and we're hiring everywhere. Yeah, first, uh, congratulations on the, on the baby. I don't know if the other help you with that. Um, <laughs> it's my second human startup. <laughs> it's definitely going to be successful. And the question, how do you deal with the bureaucracy that you, because I, I assume the German health uh, system is so much difficult than the UK. And, it's constantly changing, so you have you have to invest a lot in the lawyers. And what's your experience with this? So, yeah. So, um, no. I mean, the first thing to say is that we're very globally oriented. So Germany is an important market for us, but just one of many uh, many important markets. Um, we, uh, you know, to some extent. It's an expected that if you're working in this space, then you know there's regulations, and you're you're going to have to work within those, and that's appropriate because that's those regulations are there for a reason to keep people safe. Um, but uh, we we've launched an app that's free and that's direct to the consumer, um, and uh, 
this this obviously comes with far less red tape than trying to integrate into a hospital sort of system and into the doctor's workflow and so forth. And actually, we, we did some of that early on in the very early days, and it's, it's hard work and it's, it's slow. Um, and, and we found that, you know, by going initially the consumer route, the patient, via the patient, um, uh, and driving uptake um, and trust and you know awareness, word of mouth and, and so forth that way. Then the providers, the health plans, etc., are coming to us and asking, you know, how can we work with you? So, you know, I think um, I think that's uh, that's that's been m much more successful for us. Um, and I really honestly believe that change, real transformation in healthcare, will largely be driven from the patient side. Um, you know, people are no longer, we, we have, um, you know, an app for everything, um, instant access to things, convenient information at the tip of our, at the tip of our um, fingers uh, in, in pretty much every area in life now. And why should healthcare be any different? So people are no longer willing to exp accept the old way of doing things and they want change. So I really think change is being driven and will be driven um, in particular from the patient side, um, and in time, then the doctors and the health systems, uh, you know, do do end up changing as a result of that. The company is operating in uh, multiple uh, markets, so Germany, France, U.S. You mentioned also U.S. Um, how did you find doctors' uh, appeal to uh, to the platform? Did you see differences in doctors being more closed in Germany as compared to U.S., for example, or you didn't notice any difference whatsoever? So, um, so I think not so much differences between markets, but between GPs. So you get some GPs, um, some doctors who are real enthusiasts, technology enthusiasts, early adopters, they're real champions within their clinic or um, their, their health system for new technologies and really want to work with the most innovative technologies, help to co-develop them, provide feedback, test, pilot, and, and try to drive um, uptake. And then there are others who are less interested or more resistant, much more skeptical, you know. And, and um, you know, skepticism is reasonable um, in doctors. You know, there's a, they're, they're always concerned, of course, about patient safety and there's a set way of doing things and um, a new technology has to sort of prove itself before the wider group of, you know, any profession is going to accept it. So I think that's it's to be expected. Um, uh, so you start by working with the early adopters, um, and then you you use that as your way in, and then and then and then work from there. Um, another thing that we're seeing um, is that there's um, a real appetite um, in uh, countries in markets with less developed health infrastructure um, for a sort of more end-to-end -end solution. So the patient. Uh, connecting to the doctor and really integrating into the system and, and, and so we um, uh, we I, I can't really talk in detail because these things aren't, aren't necessarily announced but we're working um, in some of those markets um, in a way that will be helping um, helping them to build from the bottom up a sort of a new health infrastructure that's sort of really fully digitally enabled. Um, and that's something that, you know, it's much easier to do where in, in less mature markets where you don't have the type of health infrastructure we have in Germany and UK and so forth. Um, you mentioned that a bit already, but to me it sounds like a doctor's nightmare to have a patient come and say like, hey, I looked up online or on Ada and I think I have this. So how do you how do you deal how do you approach this direct interaction between a patient that has had a pre-diagnose and a, a practitioner that is maybe aware maybe not? How do you close that feedback loop of like confronting a diagnose with the yeah. one? And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so so what you have to um, remember is that uh, these days everyone's googling their symptoms. 
um, and turning up to the doctors having Googled their symptoms. And this has been one of the biggest changes in doctors' lives and how they practice in the last 10 years or so. Um, so, uh, you know, when I was a practicing doctor in hospital medicine, it was incredibly rare for someone to come in with printouts from the internet and showing them to me. And it happened, but it was rare. But now it's very much the norm. And I talk with my friends who I was at medical school with, who are um, still practicing physicians, and all the doctors that we work with at Ada, and they tell me that this is... One, one GP um, in London said to me, he works in a practice which has quite a young, you know, overall quite a young population. He said to me, I'm actually really surprised if someone hasn't Googled their symptoms before they come in. Um, and, and that can cause a huge amount of worry, unnecessary worry and concern. Um, this GP was telling me I often got 18-year-olds coming in thinking that they're having a heart attack, you know, their chest pain, uh, even though they were at the gym yesterday or they were lifting heavy boxes or something, you know, and uh, they think it's a heart attack. So you can imagine the time that goes into having to try and explain why it isn't that and why it's something else. Um, so doctors are used to this. Um, on the other hand, an AIDA assessment is much more balanced um, and, um, and provides a lot of information um, at the end in the report. So all the information the patient entered, every symptom, um, how they responded to all of the questions, and then AIDA's full report. Um, also sort of linking those symptoms and findings to the condition so you can see how they've contributed to AIDA's suggestions. Um, and the patient can actually show the doctor the, you know, that report. Um, and then that's, that's a kind of much more informed and useful conversation than, you know, the, just, just I Googled and I think it's this. Um, and actually we've had, um, we've had doctors getting in touch with us um, here in Germany and in the UK, GPs who get in touch and say, oh, I've had a couple of patients in the last couple of weeks come in with their ADA assessment um, and show it to me and it's been really helpful in the consultation and um, we've, we've had feedback that it's even led to GPs thinking of possible diagnoses they wouldn't have otherwise considered, doing tests they wouldn't have otherwise considered and they proactively get in touch and tell us that. We haven't had any doctor, not one, get in touch and say I was very unhappy the patient came in, they thought they might have something and... Um, and you have to remember also we're not giving people a diagnosis. We're only showing possibilities, none of which is 100%. Um, it's always, you know, sort of um, a, a range of different possibilities with approximate likelihoods. Um, one is do you uh, cooperate not only with doctors but with, um, let's say, uh, universities and maybe trying to uh, gets access to some new emerging tech that's maybe not even considered in the medical field, mm -hmm. like uh, all kinds of diagnoses that can actually pick up from, I, recently I read from, from sweating, mm -hmm. uh, they can pick up stuff. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, uh, how do you treat not to introduce bias even from the doctors maybe sometimes into your models? Yeah. Um you mean from practicing doctors, or you mean the doctors in our own team? Doctors in your own team and wherever you get your data for the assessment. Yeah, yeah. Um, so sensor data, for example, and uh, yeah, new technologies. So this is a really interesting area that we, yeah, we, we're very excited about. Um, and we are doing research in this area and um, um, working on some quite exciting things that we'll launch in the future. Um, but. Yeah, for sure our goal is to make the assessment more and more personalised um, so that you can actually pull in data from other sources and that can be used. So rather than having to only manually enter health information and symptoms, you could actually connect data up with, um, you know, whether it's a sweat sensor or blood pressure monitors, um, genetics. Uh, we've, we've done a lot of work in that area um, and all kinds of other microbiome, these kind of things. Um, and and I think that's going to be uh, you know a huge area in the future. It's still fairly um, uh, early. A lot of these tests, you know, it's not so clear what to do with the data. The data for some of them, blood pressure is straightforward. Microbiome a bit less so, but it's 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 a really exciting and hot area, and we're working on it. Um, so definitely, and we do have a number of collaborations with universities um, and various research projects going on and validation projects and so forth. Um, and then the other one was about bias from doctors. 
Um, so, uh, so we have a we have a big team of doctors, um, and they work. Uh, they they pull in information from published uh, literature, um, various different um, sort of sources, uh, like data sources on like prevalence and incidence data, for example. Um, so that we can localize, so the app is working appropriately in Africa versus the US and so forth and understands the differences in um, disease prevalence and um, uh, risk factors and presentation. Um, and then uh, we have a kind of curation process going on, quite sophisticated now, I've been working on this for many years, where it's always multiple doctors who work on and review um, and, and, you know, it's not their opinion, it's, it's uh, you know, it's pulled from the data um, and from the literature. We're not, we're not just using sort of raw EHR data, electronic health record data, so this is very often what people talk about when they have concerns about bias in data in healthcare, for, it, it is one example. Um, and there are some thoughts that you could maybe build a system like this just by pulling lots and lots of electronic health record data into a system and doing machine learning with it. Um, and there are, there are huge challenges with that. For a start, this da the data in that level of detail um, and comp sort of in terms of comprehensiveness um, uh, doesn't exist really. You know? So there's, if you look at electronic health record data, and we have looked and we've tried to work with it, um, it's full of gaps, uh, it, it is often f full of systematic bias, so for example in Germany, it's the same in the US, it's very common um, to get upcoding where doctors are coding for diseases that they can charge more money for than what you, you know, something a bit more severe or that code. And, um, you know, that's, that's, of course, you know, a real problem if you're trying to get reliable data. Um, very often it's just all in free text um, with a lot of, you know, misspellings and acronyms and so forth rather than coded in a way, you know, that's not structured, so it's very difficult to use. So there's lots and lots of problems with it. Um, so we don't, we don't build our knowledge base that way. Um, and, and, you know, a variety of sources of data can, can form, sort of, can, can be helpful and are used in this process, but it's no one data source and it's curated very, very carefully by many physicians. Well, and the other thing I guess to say is that there's a lot of internal testing against, against real cases as well before anything goes live. So before every release, we test everything in the system against thousands of cases. It's kind of growing reference libra library, so we're always testing how the system's performing. I understand that normally you've got a lot of bias when you think about a doctor, you can see face to face, then you have telemedicine and now you're moving to sort of an app based medicine, um, could I say, advisor. Uh, how do you bridge that gap and how do you stop misdiagnosis from this sort of uh, prevalence where the patient is obviously more worried um, and more prone to actually provide a more severe symptom than is being asked for? Um, okay, so I think there's maybe two parts to this question. So first of all, um, so we didn't, Ada never provides a diagnosis. So um, we, I think you you can't do that in this situation. You you're going by symptoms and risk factors alone, um, and uh, you can't see the patient. Uh, yeah, and and you have to recognise that there's uh, there's a de a degree of um, there's quite a difference in how patients might express certain symptoms, how they would rate the severity and so forth, you know. So um, you have to uh, uh, provide guidance with recognition of that level of uncertainty. You know, you're working um, in a situation with quite a, quite a degree of uncertainty, you know. Early, early stages maybe of something, uh, symptoms, um, patient reported, and so forth. So we never, we, we never try to provide a diagnosis on this basis. Only ever information about what might be going on, um, roughly how likely that is based on how common these conditions are in other patients with symptoms similar to that, and then information about if you think it's this condition, this is what, what you might want to do next. Um, what we found is that patients tell us that they can be very honest with Ada, uh, with, a, with a system like this, in a way that sometimes they don't feel able to be honest um, with a doctor. So for instance, they feel more comfortable um, uh, 
entering information about embarrassing, potentially stigmatized symptoms, um, and uh, you know maybe things that they haven't felt comfortable going to the doctor about for sort of a long time, and now they feel much more comfortable sort of sharing that information with this you know very um, uh, anonymous <laughs> uh, system. And so uh, I'm, I'm not sure that it's true that people are, um, are expressing that it's more severe than they would express it to a doctor when they go to, when they go to see a doctor. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, th there's there's a wide range of you know somebody if you ha if you have five or ten patients all experiencing the same symptom, the same pain, for example, then you know there'll be a, a range of, of how they express that. Of course, so we have to take that into account. So coming back to a question Baltas asked in the middle of the conversation was, is it possible to validate your algorithms? with real life data, like how do you actually validate the symptoms or the probabilities of diagnosis you're coming up? Mm -hmm. Is there a feedback loop to the system in the ongoing app? Mm -hmm. Or is it a um, feedback thing for the patient in within the app that he says, okay, I got to the GP and he diagnosed me with? And the second question is uh, regarding to the business model. Mm -hmm. So where do you actually earn money with that? Because you're at the very beginning of the patient journey by just diagnosing or like um, referring to a diagnosis. So where where is the vision? So where you, what is the plan? Where you heading? Want to head to? Mm -hmm. Especially in Germany, because I can imagine different healthcare systems. It's a different infrastructure. So one, from the one side globally and from the German perspective as well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Um, so now I've got to try and remember both questions. Um, so the first question, so validation and then business model, I think, um, and vision. Uh, so, um, so it's a real ongoing process in terms of validation. So we spent years validating internally before we launched anything direct to the consumer. Um, and this meant, you know, passing thousands of cases through the system again and again, improving it, uh, new cases that hadn't been seen before. Um, and these are largely from published cases, so real world cases that have been published, we create case vignettes, they're in the system, and then we can retest and retest against those cases. And then we have to repeatedly also do uh, tests with external doctors, with, with new cases that haven't been seen by um, Ada before, and testing, we, t we kind of also compare against doctors, so we see, you know, how is um, Ada performing, but also, you know, how well do experienced doctors perform against these cases, because, you know, for sure they don't get all of them right either, so, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of constant validation process. Um, and uh, we, we've also done a number of studies working um, in GP clinics and with doctors where we look at how well Ada's performing and matching up um, against what the patient actually had. Um, and we get feedback from patients in the real world as well. So there are various ways you can provide feedback to us um, directly within the app or sending us feedback. Um, and, and we have data from within the app where people are telling us, you know, was one of Ada's suggestions what you actually ended up having, which one was it, and so forth. Um, and of course, all of this feedback is taken into, into account. We don't automatically train on any of that because that would, I think, be dangerous because we don't know how reliable it is. Um, but all of it's taken into account and, um, and uh, uh, we have various ways of, sort of partly automating but then using, as I mentioned, our sort of in-house doctors to, um, to sort through that. Um, and then the business model, um, so, you know, we're very focused on, um, I should say we're very focused on impact um, on, on the patient, on the consumer, so, you know, individuals. So how can we reach more individuals, build the best possible product um, and really impact people, so empower people to better understand their health and better navigate to a, appropriate next steps, whether it's self-management or whether it's healthcare and accessing a provider, you know, understanding what's going on and, and what to do next. Um, and so uh, there are various ways that we can make money while doing that, but we, we you know, very focused on that mission and then how, you know, what kind of partnerships 
can basically help us to not only build a sustainable business, but to further that mission. Um, and uh, we've announced a number of partnerships in, um, well, some in, in Germany, in the US, in the UK, all of which are really um, working with health systems, health plans, um, governments to, uh, to help guide patients um, to appropriate care and providers within those services, um, so within those systems or within their health plan. So which doctors would be appropriate for you, are available, are near to you, uh, are covered by your insurance, etc. Um, and so we work with those partners and we're paid by them to basically provide high quality guidance to their patients um, into their system in an appropriate way. And there's a huge need on the provider and health plan side as well because um, there's so much inefficiency in the system. I mean, it's so common for people to go to an emergency department when they don't need to. Maybe they could have just seen a GP or to see a doctor when they don't need a doctor. Maybe just going to the pharmacy and getting something over the counter would have been more appropriate. Um, and in, in, in um, countries such as I mean, Germany, it's a new world for me, so I grew up with the NHS and you always have to see a doctor before you can go to a specialist, whether you have private healthcare or, or use the NHS. Um, to see a specialist, you have to have a referral from your NHS GP first. Uh, but here in Germany, you can choose who to go to. You know, you can, you can pick out a specialist and, and go and see them. And, and how do patients know which specialist is the right specialist for them? How do you know, before you know what's wrong, who's the right doctor to see? Um, you know, I, and, and I think this is, this is a good example of where technology like this at the front end can help guide people so that there's more chance they see a doctor who's going to um, be the best possible doctor for, for their problem. Did you ever think about maybe connecting or approaching hospitals? You talked about the emergency rooms. They're full in Germany, they make financial loss. And you partnered up with an insurance company, I think, in Hamburg. So wouldn't it be great to partner up with hospitals as suppliers as they uh, know where the patients are? And always I use ADA. I use it when I have free time at home. But it would be perfect if it's integrated into the waiting room, right? Yeah. Or into the emergency room. Yeah, we are working with providers as well. Um, so we we have um, a partnership in California with a really large health system there. Um, we're working with the NHS and with GP clinics in the NHS in the UK. Um, and we do have um, a number of sort of research partnerships and pilots going on in Germany in clinics, emergency rooms, and so forth. So there is there are things that we're doing. Um, and this waiting room app, uh, you know, that's that's maybe a very good idea. But for sure, you know, you, you use it at, at home or, or you could equally use ADA in a waiting room and then it gets sent directly to um, uh, to the doctor. Uh, and and um, uh, we've, we've piloted that in the UK um, and uh, there are things going on here in Germany as well. So maybe there'll be a wider rollout. Um, at some point, but but some of those things take time, you know. In in, in healthcare, integrating into the workflow of um, of clinics and hospitals and systems, that that can be a bit slower than some of the other things that we're doing. So for sure, we're working on it, and we do have those partnerships. But but um, yeah, some some of them take a little bit of time. Okay. I had a question. Um, so I would imagine that expectations and user expectations around data privacy are very different in different markets um, and different countries. Um, does it lead you to um, kind of, in general, how do you, you know, work around this? Um, and how do you unify those processes? And um, kind of, do you, have you found a universal system on educating customers in those, you know, um, and those different markets and managing those expectations? Um, so uh, so it, it's definitely true that um, on the whole, uh, you know, on average, there are more concerns about data privacy in some markets than others. So Germany, for example, we get more questions about this than, um, than you know, some other parts of the world. Um, 
But our, our approach um, is universal, you know, everywhere, whether you're a user in India or Africa or the US or Germany. Um, and, you know, we're very, very strict about it and take it very seriously. Obviously, we have to comply with GDPR. We also have all these ISO certifications for information security, which we did voluntarily. And we, we you know, we, we work very hard, you know, on continually um, you know, making sure that we're as rigorous as possible. Basically, we, we're very clear with users when you first sign up and when you uh, sort of check the T's and C's and so forth, we make it very clear that we never share your data with anybody without your explicit you know, permission, in fact, request for us to do so. So it would only be, for example, if you're, um, you know, if you're asking uh, us to share it with your doctor, for example. Um, we also um, keep uh, all personal information and then health information separate at all times for sort of both transfer and storage and all encrypted, you know. So all these sort of, um, uh, the, 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 everything you would expect and as rigorous as possible, you know. And, 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 um, and I think that's all you can do really and constantly be vigilant. Um, and uh, we do get questions about it, mostly only in Germany, which is interesting, but we do. <laughs> Hi. Um, so what kind of challenges are you facing right now as an organization, um, having grown so much and you know, the journey that you're on? And if there was one thing that you could fix tomorrow, which would it be? Yeah, so, um, so scaling always brings challenges. Um, and you know, one thing has been recently we've we've long outgrown our office here on Albertstrasse and needed more desks to hire more people. But it can be really hard to find um, new office space uh, here in Berlin. Certainly, if you're looking for quite large office space. Um, and and we were looking for some months, and everything fell through, and we finally found somewhere. But um, nowhere's perfect, and so we actually have to keep both keep both offices um, because I think we're gonna. Uh, you know, the place we found is bigger than our current current office, but it wouldn't it wouldn't be enough for a long time. So you know, we we um, we have to now split our team. But um, you know, that's office space uh, hiring for sure, hiring fast enough, um, and and I think also growing up a bit, not just growing, but growing up as a company. And by this, I mean um, the kind of processes and systems and structures that you need in place um, when you're a slightly more grown-up company that you didn't need in place and didn't have in place when you're a small company. You know, trying to build those out um, uh, in a way that's still lean and you know, agile and so forth, but that, uh, that's not as scrappy as it used to be, and knowing that you'll need to change them probably not too far in the future as you grow further is a kind of constant process, and I think you probably always feel like you didn't do it quite soon enough, you know, and you're, you're a little bit behind in that, but you're constantly having to do that and bring on people into the team who've done that before elsewhere, who've worked at greater scale than you, than, than you have, you know, so bring on people into the management team who've worked in companies of several hundred people, or I guess in the future, you know, if we grow more, then it might be people who've worked in companies of several thousand people and scaled them and scaled them uh, through that journey. So you need to bring on people who've done it before to help you with that process. Um, if I could fix one thing, it would be hiring faster, you know, it's it just, um, just uh, is there's a war for talent. I think we have, um, you know, an incredible mission and uh, sort of product, so that makes it easier to hire great talent, great talent, but it always takes longer than you want, and, uh, you know, we, we have lots of openings, and um, we spend a lot of time on recruitment, uh, but that would be the thing I would change if I could just, you know, click my fingers and have all those people in place today. That would be amazing. <laughs>